Good morning. How are we today? Are we super excited? Because I know I say this every Sunday, but you realize how special this day is, right? Right? Today is the day we get to come together. Church is all out there. But we get to come together here to worship together, to learn together, to grow together, to commune together, to be together as a family. That's what church is. Right? It's not a place just to come how I did my check off. It's to come here and to grow. And that's my prayer. Every day, is my, this is my prayer. Lord, change me a little bit today. So today I say, Father in heaven, who is so faithful, never, ever, ever lets us down. I pray that today you will change us just a little bit more. And Father, I know things come against us. You see them. And I know you use every one of those to shape us more into the image of the person that you saw eons ago before we were even here. Lord, you love us, and I thank you for that. So with that, Lord, I say anything that can come our way, anything that can try to destroy it, bring it, because we have you. We love you. We praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Will you guys stand up with me, and let's worship together. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. You're faithful, faithful in no
Father, we just thank you so much. We praise you. We give you everything of us today. Not because of any other reason except that you are worthy. And when I think about everything that does come our way and tries to destroy us, you just take that and you use it to build us and change us more. So when I sing this song, and it's called Standing in Your Love, Father, and I think about standing right there where you are in the midst of all the things that try to take us down and destroy us, I can't help but to look up and have a smile on my face knowing while I'm standing in your love, Father, nothing can take me, nothing can destroy me. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken, oh, I won't be shaken, cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I
stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear chance when I yes my fear. I'm standing in your love, standing in his love, yes I'm standing on the rock, yes I'm standing in your love, sing that with me, yes I'm standing on the rock and I'm standing in your love it's a proclamation yes I'm standing on the rock and I'm standing in your love in your love in your love thank you Father He's so faithful. Thank you, Father. Man, I love worshiping him. Just saying his name, Father God, Yahweh. We worship you. We thank you. There's no other place I'd rather be than right here. There's no other place I'd rather be than right here. In your presence, worshiping you feeling your arms around us. All the things, again, that try to tear us down. They're in our minds right now trying to pull our attention away from him. But he stays right there, his faithfulness. And he turns all that junk into beauty. We thank him for that. Search the world, but it couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise, the treasures that fade, I never knew that you came along. Here in your love, I love this part. Oh, this.
singing that cause there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you thank you father who you are so worthy Singing that song, I know it comes to an end, Lord, but I just pray that it'll just stay in our mind and in our spirits every time something comes to try to destroy us. Lord, there's nothing, there is nothing better than you. There is nothing that can overcome you. There is nothing that can replace you. Heavenly Father, who is not just this Father that we can't reach, but the Father that wants to be intimately involved with us. There is nothing you can't do, and there is nothing better than you. Lord, I pray today that every one of our hearts are soft and open for your word to come in and change us again today, as you faithfully always do. Change us again today. In your precious name, Lord, I pray. Amen. Good morning. As you're seated this morning, thanks for coming into the, being part of the house of God today and coming to Legacy Church either here or online. And there are so many things happening in the life of our church. If you want to find out everything that's going on, we always say this and we say it, we say it the right way. But check out LegacyChurchGA.com. That has every single thing that you need to let you know about what's going on in the life of your church. But I do wanted to highlight something today. If you're new here or if, if you've been here for a while, also there's a QR code that you can scan that will take you straight to the, the church. But the thing I want to highlight today is Easter. Easter's coming up. And so if you're in service today and you look on your seat, there's an Easter card sitting on your chair. If you're online, you can also go online and share the uh, or look at the Facebook or look at Facebook or Instagram and find out the information about our Easter services. But we have Good Friday coming up before Easter at the Canton Theater, and that's one of the places we're going this year. And then right after that, that next Sunday, we're going to have our we're going to have Easter service right here at the Bluffs. So what I want you to do right now, if you're in the room, we're going to try a little we're going to try a little exercise real quick. Take that card that's in your hand and hand it to the person next to you. Just just want to trade it out. You see how easy that was? That's as easy as it is to invite somebody to the Easter service and the Good Friday service. That's all the info they need. 
So if you can do that here, if you go online, it's so easy to click that share button on Facebook. And the more you share it out, the more people see it. And the more people see it, the more people we get to invite to Easter and bring them into the house of God so they can know more about him. So it's exciting that's coming up. We're excited about everything else that's happening today. And one of the other things I'm excited about, if you're a, if you're a kid who's fifth grade and younger, you can head on back to Children's Church. And the rest of us, let's pray about this service today and pray about what God has for us during this time of Lent. Father God, we ask you to bless us today. Lord, we ask you to bless this message that's about to come. Lord, give us, give us excitement for it. Give us the, the feeling that we need today, the, the know-how from you to take what's being said today and to take it out into the world. Father, we thank you. Bless the words that come out right now. Bless our hearts as it's already been said. Let them be soft today to receive the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I just want to encourage all of us, you know, that there's power in a personal invitation. And these cards, as Jeff mentioned, are just a tool uh, for us to start a conversation, extend an invite. Uh, so uh, I want to invite you to join us in praying for what God's going to do uh, on Easter weekend, uh, both Good Friday at the Canton Theater and here on Sunday, on Easter Sunday uh, at, at 10 o'clock. So I uh, want to invite you to take one. There's also more. Uh, out in the lobby, you'll see on the table right as you go out these doors uh, to my left, uh, there's some more there. And we have uh, plenty of them, so, you know, don't, don't be, feel uh, ashamed about taking a whole bunch of them with you. Uh, we have plenty to go around, so uh, I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, how many of us in the room would describe ourselves as foodies? Raise your hand, like you... Okay, one person. Okay, great. Uh, well, okay, three or four of you. Okay, are, are you're finally coming around to being honest. Uh, how many of us in the room, how many of us would say the person next to us is a foodie, but they don't admit it? Okay, a few more, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, but as a foodie, uh, you, you, what's a regular practice? You take a picture of your food, right? And uh, so I, uh, I discovered this... Um, restaurant in Boulder, Colorado. It is called Zeal. There's a picture of it. And uh, on their website, they, they describe themselves in this way. It says, you enthusiastically get it. We call it food for enthusiasts. I thought that was pretty interesting. Like this is, uh, the, the restaurant is named after having enthusiasm for food. And today we are beginning a, a new series called Witness His Resurrection, where leading up to Easter, we're going to be looking at some characters in the Easter story and drawing some, uh, some things out of that. Uh, and, and today we are talking about Simon the Zealot. Now, zeal is not, uh, it's really not a word that we use too often, I, I think, in our language, you know, but, but we can also think of zeal as passion or enthusiasm, uh, fervor, you know, or words that we might use. But zeal is defined as great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. And, and there are lots of things when you think about it that we have zeal for. In fact, I want you to think for just a moment um, if one of these sort of triggers something in you that you have zeal for. We have zeal for fitness, right? Uh, for food, or sports, or shopping, gaming, uh, recreation, politics, uh, pleasure, recognition, television, books, and work. You know, there are lots of things that we can have a, a great energy or enthusiasm for. And maybe one of those things that I mention uh, brings something to your mind. You say, yeah, I have a lot of enthusiasm or energy. And, and here's the thing. Zeal can be a really positive force. I mean, it can really be the driving force behind some really good things that happen. And several years ago, uh, an 11-year-old boy named Tyler uh, Brunst in uh, California, Loomis, California, he got a catalog in the mail or, or saw a catalog in the mail from World Vision and he took it to his mom. And if you don't know World Vision, it's a global humanitarian organization. And he took this catalog from World Vision to his mom and said, Mom, I want to help get clean water to Africa. 
Now, how much could an 11-year-old boy do? You might think, well, that sounds great, and you know, it's great that he got sort of that enthusiasm. Well, Tyler decided to open a lemonade stand, and he raised over $16,000 for clean water with World Vision. Now, we can probably think of, of, of a, a story that's similar to that, and, and there really are countless stories that we can think of or in our culture of people who get uh, an energy or enthusiasm, something is sparked in them, and they decide to put all of their uh, energy and efforts into that cause, into that purpose. And, and maybe you know of someone right now, you say, yeah, I know this person, maybe it's a family member or a friend or co-worker even who just has great zeal and energy and enthusiasm for a cause no matter what it is and so it sort of sparks this question in me of what does it take to live a life of zeal what does that involve and, and I would venture to say as they ask that question that maybe there's something that you would love to have more energy or enthusiasm towards or, or you, maybe you say yeah I would love to to be known as a person who has great zeal a passion and energy towards a cause what does it take to live a life of zeal now there's a, a the, today we're starting this series witnesses resurrection with Simon the zealot now Simon the zealot there's not a lot about him in the scripture. In fact, he's just mentioned in the list of 12 disciples, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Simon the Zealot, I mean, it's kind of an interesting, you know, sort of tag onto his name. I mean, wouldn't you love to have a tag onto your name? Like Kelly the Encourager. Or Marsha the, the Prayer Warrior. Or Jesse, the amazing guitar and vocal worship leader. Jesse, the shoe king. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to have something tagged onto your name that, that sort of was a, an indication of the passion and energy that you had? Well, Simon had that. Simon the zealot. Now, zealots were... Uh, the scholars are not really sure what exactly they were. They're, uh, they're not, it, it could have been a, a rebellious group uh, that Simon was a part of that sort of were resisting the Roman occupation and rule. It, it could have been that Simon was zealous for the law. It could have also been that Simon was zealous for Jesus and Jesus' teachings. But no matter the, the exact meaning of zealousness, Simon had that. Now, now, as we talked about, as I mentioned, being zealous can be a good thing. It's, whenever you have that energy and passion behind something, it, it can be a really good thing. But spiritual zealousness can be a tricky thing also. Because it can either draw people to Jesus or repel them away, depending on the focus. Now, I think we've all seen examples of spiritual zeal that has gone terribly wrong. I mean, the Westboro Baptist uh, and their infamous protests, religious cults, or examples of terrorism where people strap bombs to their chest in the name of, of religious zeal. But I think there are other examples of religious zeal that are more subtle and yet also harmful. A friend of mine recently told me about a, a blog that they read in which uh, they were really trying to to find some good resources for spiritual growth. And they looked up this blog, and the author of this blog had broken down all the times in the day that we should pray. And they broke it all the way down to, to the exact number of hours every day. And they added it up and, and concluded in this blog that we should be praying 17 hours and 43 minutes every single week. Now, how many of us this last week prayed 17 hours and 43 minutes or more in our prayer life? Not me. Not me. <gasps> you mean you don't pray 24 hours a day? I mean, I know it's shocking to you, and I know your, your image of me has just been shattered. 
But I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say maybe none of us prayed 17 hours and 43 minutes or more this past week. A friend of mine told me that, you know, that they read this blog and it just sort of like was discouraging. They, they felt, you know, less than because they, they were not praying 17 hours and 43 minutes. And they just thought that, so they just thought, well, what do I do? I mean, it's, uh, I, you know, I'm just, God's just not going to let me on the team if I don't pray 17 hours and 43 minutes. You see, here's the thing about zeal. When zeal is misdirected, it leads to shame and condemnation. True zeal leads to passion and fervor for God, where God is exalted, where God gets the credit, where God is the focus and not ourselves. See, Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about religious zeal in the book of Romans, chapter 10, and he's writing about the Israelites and their zeal for God. And listen to what he says. He says, for I can testify, verse 2, about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. He's talking about the Israelites. He's saying, look, they were zealous for God. I mean, they had zeal. It's just that their zeal was misdirected. And what is misdirected zeal? Misdirected zeal is when the focus is on our righteousness and our efforts and what we're doing to be more accepted by God, to earn points with God, to get more favor with God, to have God be impressed with us. That is religious zeal that is misdirected. Paul says, yeah, they had zealous for God, but their zeal was based on knowledge. He goes on to say that since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. See, there's sort of this warning when it comes to zeal. It's, it's like a fire that has to be sort of properly directed because when it's a fire that's not, you know, it, it sort of burns out of control like a wildfire to where we can, we have the zeal, but it's not God-directed and God-focused. It's self-focused and self-consumed. I mean, misdirected zeal ends up turning inward for righteousness, believing that our right standing with God is up to us. See, this is really false zeal. And, and I think there's some defining characteristics of false zeal. See, false zeal is blind. It's, it's consumed with self-righteousness, so much so that it is blind to the true righteousness that comes from God. It's self-seeking. It uses religion as a means of personal gain. Uh, there's a pretense of godliness. But underneath this is a, a self-directed purpose. False zeal is misguided. It's, it's way more concerned with minor disputes and less concerned with the weighty matters of God. You ever seen a, a church dispute where if you really sort of unpacked it, you're like, this really doesn't make a big difference. I mean, what are we actually talking about? What are we arguing about? I mean, I know that that's never happened. I mean, talking about other churches, but, but, but this, you know, the, you, have you ever just sort of stopped and thought, well, this is, what are we even arguing about? This really doesn't make a difference. This is not what we're supposed to be about. That's misdirected zeal. False zeal values tradition over obedience. False zeal props up the way that we've always done things over being obedient to Jesus and his mission. False zeal is impulsive. It favors a quick reaction over thoughtful conviction. So I think all of us can easily fall into a sort of a false zeal when it comes to our walk with Jesus, but there's a true zeal that is clear in its definition. See, true zeal, on the other hand, is God-focused. You see the difference where it's God-focused and God-directed, where our passion and energy is directed at honoring God's name and glorifying him with our life, pleasing God. That's the focus. We care deeply about that. True zeal is fearless. 
True zeal does not crumble at the sight of opposition, but it's actually strengthened by it. True zeal is knowledgeable. It it seeks to live by the wisdom of God and not the wisdom of what culture or social media says. True zeal is passionate. It stands for truth even when it's hard and even when it costs us something. True zeal leads to obedience. True zeal makes us hear God's word with reverence, to pray with persistence, and to love others with brotherly affection. True zeal is enduring and cannot be quenched when the wind blows or when a little bit of water is poured on it. There's a desperate need for people to be zealous for God. And we've had two years of a pandemic, over two years, and it's caused a lot of loss and suffering. But I'm afraid there's, a, there's another pandemic, a pandemic of complacency. See, my, my fear is there, there's a pandemic of complacency in the church. And, and I, listen, I don't say that lightly to make light of anything that's happened with COVID. I say that because I believe that that COVID has sort of unearthed uh, another pandemic of complacency where we've just sort of become comfortable in the church and, and it's caused a lot of loss too. I mean, the, a pandemic of complacency causes a lot of loss, a lot of suffering, a lot of misguided and misdirected zeal. See, the definition of complacency is a feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. See, we can think of it as just being satisfied with the way things are. Have we become complacent in the church? That's one of the most dangerous things that can happen. And it can actually happen in all walks of life. I mean, we see examples of of businesses that become complacent. You know, they have some success and they just sort of live on that success and stay right there and say, we're good, you know. And when businesses and companies and organizations fail to to innovate, when they become complacent, they fail to innovate. And when they fail to innovate, they die. They eventually die off. Restaurants can become complacent. When they lose their focus on customers and what, what makes them who they are. See, this is what happened to Burger King. Burger King just became complacent. They thought that they could just rest on the laurels of the Whopper and then the Whopper Junior and now the Whopper that's not meat, it's something else, you know. I mean, they're trying, but they became complacent and Chick-fil-A passed them. You know, Chick-fil-A is like, "Woo, see you, Burger King. And now who goes to Burger King? I mean, when's the last time you went to Burger King? Just think about it. Ever, yeah. I went to it during COVID because it was like a moment of desperation. I mean, it was... That's the only time that anyone goes to Burger King. We can become complacent in our relationships. We become complacent in our marriage. Where spouses begin to, you know, think about themselves and what their needs are instead of serving the other person. Right? Complacency can happen at any point in our relationships and in our marriages, sports teams can become complacent, resting on the laurels of past success. Now think about complacency when it comes to your relationship with Jesus. See, complacency is a perfect tool for the enemy to keep you right where you are and not moving forward. Complacency is a perfect tool to keep churches from moving forward. Hey, it's not, it's, it's not worth the risk. If you've ever heard, hey, it's not worth the risk, we might upset some people, we might, you know, I don't know, I don't want to know, I don't know, we don't want people to leave. If you've ever heard that, that's a church that's become complacent. We become satisfied with where we are, and that is when we are in trouble. The moment that we are satisfied with where we are, both in our personal life, and the life of our church, that is when we become complacent. See, the times that, that God does the most work with us are the times 
He pulls us out of our comfort zone. And he teaches us to rely on him. So you can't learn dependence on God in complacency. It's not there. Dependence on God happens when we are pulled out of our comfort zone. When we, when we are a little bit uncomfortable with things. So I want to ask you, how comfortable are you in your walk with Jesus? You're probably familiar with Jeff Foxworthy. Jeff Foxworthy's You Might Be a Redneck bit. Now, this is not like that, but it's sort of similar. You might be complacent if you can't remember the last time your way of thinking was challenged. If you value traditions over what Scripture actually says, you might be complacent. If you haven't stepped out on faith, whether it's in your family life or your work life, if you haven't taken a step of faith in, in, in a while, you might be complacent. I read this week, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of life is not death, it's complacency. A complacent person is searching for life. I think all of us become complacent at times. This is not a condemnation or a judgment. This is just a, maybe it's a reality check. Maybe if you've become complacent in your life, your spiritual life, your walk with Jesus, without zeal, if you say, my, my spiritual life is dead. If, you, if you're saying, you know, I, I don't have energy or enthusiasm or passion for Jesus. I feel like I'm just going through the motions. I feel like I'm just showing up week after week after week. I'm not really hearing from God. I'm not really seeing God move in my life. I, I look around and I don't really see his presence or feel his presence. I have two words for you. Move forward. Move forward. That you cannot stay where you are. So I believe the, the seeds of true zeal are sown in repentance. Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 3, he says, Not that I've already obtained this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on. See, that's Paul's words for move on, move forward, press on. It says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here's the reality. We're never, we're never fully there in our walk with Jesus. There's never a point where we say, okay, I've, I've reached the point of full maturity. I've reached the point I want to reach. I'm, I'm good. You know, there's really nothing more for me to learn. Yeah, I've read through the Bible in a year. And yeah, you know, I've, I've done all that church stuff. And I'm just kind of there. And I'll just kind of coast from here on out, right? Cash in my chips and just live on, live on all that success. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, says, I have not obtained this. I mean, if Paul, the guy who wrote most of the New Testament, says, I really haven't arrived yet. That's sort of an indicator to us that there's always more for us to pursue in our relationship with Jesus. I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What's the goal? The goal is to live forever with God. The goal is to live forever with God. The seeds of true zeal are sown in repentance. See, sometimes our zeal or our passion for God is drained because we're constantly looking over the shoulder and dwelling on past regret. I think regret's one of the things that sucks the life out of a Christ follower. It, it drains our zeal. It drains our passion. It drains our energy. We come to faith in Jesus, and we, we get excited about our faith in Jesus. We're enthusiastic. We want to share Jesus with others, and then we're reminded, oh, hey, <laughs> don't forget what you did. See, the enemy doesn't want us to move forward. He wants us to stay right here. So he reminds us of, hey, remember that thing you did a few years ago? I mean, you call yourself a Christ follower. Just 
Here, let me remind you. And past regret is an obstacle to true zeal. We can't shake the mistakes of our past, so we think God can't use us. He doesn't have a real purpose for us. I mean, how could he possibly have any purpose for me? I've, I've got too much baggage. If you only knew what I did, and that's where our zeal gets sapped. But see, repentance is the vehicle through which we go in a new direction. True zeal is, begins in repentance. It's sown in repentance. Repentance means that we change our minds, that we rethink the way that we think. And I think most of the time we think of repentance as like this guy standing on the street with a cardboard sign saying, repent or you're going to burn, loser. And that's our image of repentance. But repentance is actually an invitation. It's, a, it's an invitation to turn around and go in a new direction. Repentance is, it means that we do a 180. Where we turn away from that thing that, is, that we're trying to find fulfillment in and turn towards Jesus that, that, there, that he frees us from the pressure to perform. See, when we repent, we're freed of the pressure to be the person that we've exhausted ourselves trying to be. And freedom is found in repentance. And repentance is not that thing that we did a while ago at the camp meeting where we found Jesus and we repented. Repentance is a daily discipline, a daily practice. I find it interesting that the first word that Jesus spoke to people when he began his ministry was the word repent. And Jesus didn't come and say, hey, guys, like, okay, party time's over. We got to clean things up. You know, you're going to pay up for your mistakes. He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. He said, things are changing. Like, there's a new, there's a new way here. And it's not found in, in religious moralism or keeping the rules or keeping ourselves on the straight and narrow. It's found in me. So turn around and come towards me. It's an invitation for life. See, spiritual zeal, spiritual zeal, true zeal is enthusiasm, enthusiasm for the glory of God and the kingdom of God. Where our chief purpose in life is pleasing God. That's it. That is true enthusiasm. That's true zeal. Where God's name and his honor and his glory and him getting the credit is the sole focus of our life. Is that true of you? Is his honor the sole focus of your life. J.C. Ryle says, a zealous man in religion is preeminently a man of one thing. It is not enough to say that he is earnest, hearty, uncompromising, thoroughgoing, wholehearted, fervent in spirit. He sees one thing. He cares for one thing. He lives for one thing. He's swallowed up in one thing. And that one thing is to please God. So what is your one thing? Is it to please God? Is it to have zeal for God? Is it enthusiasm for the glory of God and the kingdom of God? To see yourself in your life as being a display of God's glory here on earth. And a picture and a foretaste and a sample and an appetizer of the kingdom of God. What is your one thing? If it is not to please God, I want to invite you to turn around, to repent. To turn away from that thing that is your one thing and turn towards Jesus as your one thing. To say nothing is better. Nothing is better than you, Lord. Nothing is better than you. 
Sometimes we try to bring along something else. It's like nothing is better than you. But yeah, you know, I've got this job and it's really going well. And I, I'm going to just, that's going to be my one thing. But nothing is better than you. Jesus, I've got this, you know, this relationship over here. I mean, I'm really hoping that they'll say yes, that they'll marry me. And, the, you know, this is my vision for our life. But nothing is better than you. Man, this, this church, I mean, I wish, it's, it's not like my last church, but uh, if they would just do this and this and this, and it would just be, then it would be, you know, then things would be great. And, and you know, I just, I don't understand why they do this or this. Or this. If they could just do it like my last church, it would be great. I mean, that, but nothing is better than you. See, I, I think that God is inviting us in this moment to fight against complacency, to have true zeal. Listen, God can spark a movement with just a few people that are zealous for him. I mean, it's sort of happened before. I mean, he sparked a movement with 12, you know, ordinary guys, ordinary guys, just like, well, I mean, we don't really know what's happening here. Just, you know, they didn't really get it. I mean, even after the after Jesus went to the cross and after the resurrection, they they thought, well, man, that was a good ride. We had three good years. Man, that Jesus guy, I mean, he taught some good messages. He did a few really cool healings. And, oh, that fish and chips miracle was my favorite. I guess it's over now. You know, we'll write a book about it and maybe sell some copies. And they didn't even get it till after he was like, hey, guys, it's me. Remember, like, see the nails in the hands. I'm back. And he sparked a movement with 12 people who were willing to make Jesus the one thing in their life. And he wants to do it through you. He wants to do it through you. Don't look next to you and be like, oh, well, maybe it's the person next to me. or It's you. What would happen in your life and in your family and in your workplace and in your neighborhood and in this community if you made Jesus your one thing? A movement would be sparked. This community would be transformed. I, I don't want to go, I don't want to keep going on, but I just read this past week, and I'm not, this is kind of way off topic. If one family in every church adopted one child every year, there would be zero orphans. Zero. If one family in every church in America adopted one orphan a year, there would be zero orphans. <laughs> See, so that I, t I share that with you because sometimes we think, well, it's too big. I mean, it's too, too much dark stuff going on, and there's so much poverty, and there's so much sickness, and there's so much, you know, godlessness, and there's just look around, and I get, I get it. I hear you. But it is not a hopeless thing. That's what God has put us here on this earth to do. To be a light in darkness. To make Jesus our one thing. And to be glimpses of a kingdom that is eternal. That is perfect and whole. The way God intended that we don't settle for the way things are. That we move forward in zeal, in passion, in energy for him. God can spark a movement through a few people. With zeal. So will you be that person that makes Jesus your one thing? Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would just, you would move. 
That's all we want. We want to see you move. We want to see you work. We want to see evidence of you in our life. And God, I don't think there's a person in this room, if they're a Christ follower, that, that says, oh, I don't want to have zeal. We, we want to have more passion and energy for you, God. And sometimes we don't know where to start. And sometimes it's misdirected. And we need your wisdom to direct it in, in a way that it's focused on you. And so we ask for that. Father, we ask for you to move in the next few moments, that we would put away distractions, we would push back the efforts of the enemy that does not want your spirit to move and worship, and doesn't want there to be zeal, doesn't want there to be transformation, doesn't want there to be miracles. So God, we push back complacency. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take communion in just a moment, and I want to invite you to come forward. There's a tray on each side of the stage that when you're ready, when the band starts playing, uh, you're invited to make your way, and there's a cup. You peel off the top layer. It's a piece of bread representing Jesus' body broken for us, and the next layer you peel off, and it's juice representing his blood for us. We do this every week here, and the reason we do this, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. That without Jesus' death and resurrection, we are just merely a social club. So this is the reason we're here. So I want to invite you to come forward. And today as you come forward, to reflect on your life with him. And ask him, say, God, give me zeal for you. Give me zeal and passion for you to make you my one thing. Let's take communion together. Singing over me, you have been so so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so so kind to me. Holy, overwhelming, never-ending, breathless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found. Leave the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself.
continue on crying, Lord, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't. That is the truth. The things that try to kill us, break us, and finish us, they're nothing. Because there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't get down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. That's a great way to go out, that truth, the reminder that there's nothing that God won't do to bring us back to himself. And so the invitation is for us to give ourselves to him, to live a life of zeal. So let's live a life of zeal, of passion, enthusiasm for him and his mission. As you go, I want to invite you to give back to him, to practice generosity, uh, to move the mission forward. You can give online. That's really the best way to give. Uh, but it's uh, also an opportunity to give uh, in service. When you go out the doors, there's a box out there. Uh, you can drop a check or cash in that. Uh, and it allows us to move the mission forward. A few weeks ago, we sent uh, $2,500 to partner churches in Ukraine. Uh, that are engaged in efforts there. And your generosity helps to make that happen. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you in advance for practicing that today as we leave. I want to invite you back next week. We continue this series. Take a card with you and join us in praying for God to move on Easter to leave the 99 and bring people back to himself. So take the card, start a conversation, use it in prayer, ask God to use you, to use you. Have a great week. Thank you guys for being here.